Wazimatrix and welcome to Wazimatrix. My name is Luni and today we're assisting you with your final exam prep for life sciences. All you need to do to get your questions and comments through to us is follow Wazimatrix on all our social media platforms as well as hit us up on our WhatsApp line. Don't forget to download the To Enable app for free on your app store to take part in today's assessment. The details are all on the screen. We've got a cool competition going on for you guys, so please stay tuned to get all of those details later on in the show. Today I've got Nicoline, our sign language interpreter, as well as our awesome teacher, Yugen. Thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Thanks, Luni. Welcome, folks. Guys, we're looking at Life Sciences Paper 1 today. This is the final push. You guys have really worked well this year, and we're trying to get you the last a bit ready for Paper 1. So guys, we're going to look at some questions this, this lesson. Uh, we have posted some of these questions on, on the social media app, and we'd like you to respond to them. And we're going to look at your responses towards the end of this session, and we're going to go through those questions. So I've put in a few questions on, and you can download those questions, try and attempt them, and then we will look at these questions at the end. So before we get into it, I'm going to share the first question that I've put out to you. And I'd like to call that a challenge question to you. And let's see how many of you can spot the right answer. And probably we can engage on that in terms of see why and how you've got come to that answer in our last segment. So let's get straight into the lesson. And here's the question for you guys. So the question we're looking at is, during, multi during meiosis 2, the chromosomes A arrange themselves at the equator of the cell in homologous pairs. B, the chromosome number is halved. C, the chromosomes line up at the equator of the cell individually. Or D, the whole chromosomes move to the opposite poles of the cell. So folks, this is obviously a question based on meiosis and it requires that you know the different stages of meiosis pretty well. And obviously you need to understand the characteristics of each stage. And hence, it's sometimes these kind of appear quite confusing if you don't understand the distinct features of each stage and hence you need to know them quite well. So in your planning for this final exam, read through the characteristics of each stage. Know that you can identify them from simple descriptions and so that a question like this becomes much easier for you to answer and also for you to be able to get those marks that are probably the easier marks to get at the start of the exam. So I'm going to leave that with you guys to sim over and then as we get into the lesson, I'm hoping that you guys can attempt the other questions and we can respond to those at the end. So in our lesson today, we have looked at questions from um, past exam papers and I've taken questions from the DBE November 2019 exam paper as well as uh, questions from the Eastern K paper which was written this year during the prelim exams. And so that you can then have a, a kind of a, a guide as to different questions from different examining boards. And the idea is to expose you to these questions and give you a better opportunity to be able to understand how to apply your content to different situations. Okay, so the table below shows essentially um, the comparison of the composition of the amniotic egg in three different bird species. Now guys, the word composition is an important word in this. And composition refers to the collective makeup that is present in the amniotic egg. And again, it's important for you to go and study the structure of the amniotic egg. And remember that this section comes in in the reproductive strategies of invertebrates. So knowing the amniotic egg, the structure, the function of the amnion, chorion, allantois, um, the yolk sac. You also need to look at different reproductive strategies such as the development of the egg, oviparous, viviparous, ovoviviparous. We also need, need to know the definitions of internal fertilization as well as external fertilization. So that's kind of in a nutshell. And this is probably one of the smaller sections that generally are always in the paper, that if you learn well, you would get those marks. Okay, so the table shows you the composition of one, the yolk, two, the water content, and three, the energy available to the developing um, embryo inside that egg. And here it's a comparison of three different bird species. And here if you look at that, you would very quickly look at this egg having the highest content of yolk. And if you think about the structure of the yolk and its function, 
The yolk is essentially the nutrition that the baby or the developing fetus, or in this case, the, the embryo requires. The next is the water content, and the water content in this bird species, number one, is significantly higher than the others. And then if we look at the energy, you can see that bird species, too, has the highest amount of energy available. And so the egg of this, of this bird species, number two, obviously has a lot of yolk, and that yolk is able to sustain the energy requirements for the developing um, embryo inside. So let's look at the questions that are related to this. So the first question, as I mentioned, you've got to know the definitions of the terms ovo, vivipari. Now if we go back to reproductive strategies, there are three terms. Oviparous, ovo, viviparous, and then vivipari. Now if we compare these terms, it's easier to understand them. And often they get very confusing, especially ovo, viviparous, and oviparous. Now let's try and understand the, the easiest of them. So we as humans have a strategy where the egg develops internally and has an umbilical cord, which supplies the developing fetus with nutrition. And so the baby is directly attached to the mother via an umbilical cord. And that strategy or development of the egg we refer to as being viviparous. Okay, so that's humans. So you remember humans are viviparous. If we compare the other two, which is oviparous, oviparous refers to an egg that develops in a shell. That's external. So if we think of a chicken egg that develops outside the body, it relies on the yolk and gets its nutrition from that yolk with no direct attachment to the mother. So the egg develops, the, 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 the mother either incubates the egg and that egg will hatch and you'll find that that egg would have uh, given the sustenance to the developing embryo through its yolk and the albumin. If we look at ovo vivipari, that's a combination of vivipari and oviparous. And that's when a young embryo or young individual hatches out of the, the mother. And that's because the egg would have developed internally with no direct attachment to the mother. And so she gives birth to young that have developed internally with no direct nutrition from the mother. So that's essentially what I've done now. I've been able to describe to you or define the concept of oviparie. Let's move on to the next question. So the question reads, which one of the bird species, one, two, or three, are most probably shows precocial development? Now guys, if we go back to understanding the concept of the development of an egg, you know that there are two distinct strategies. One is precocial and the other is altricial. And essentially what differentiates the two is the development that occurs in the egg and at the time of birth, the readiness of the young one to be able to be independent or requires time for development. So precocial organisms that show that reproductive strategy generally are born capable of soon after birth being able to carry out independence. So they will be able to feed, walk, run, open their eyes. So that's precocial. And in that we have different degrees of precocial development. However, that's essentially the idea. If we look at altricial development, altricial development is where the young are born but are very dependent on the parent because they are not independent, they're not capable of feeding or moving by themselves. So these individuals require lots of parental care, nourishment and care from the parents in terms of providing food, warmth and initial care. Whereas your precocial would find, you'll find that as soon as the young are born, in a few hours they're able to stand up, move, feed, breathe, swim. So those, that development happens a lot in the egg. So the initial development happens in the egg. And so there's, there needs to be a lot of nutritional supply in that developing egg for the young to develop and become quite independent soon after hatching. Okay, so knowing that, we can refer to that information in this question. So which one of the following bird species is most likely precocial? And the idea behind being pre precocial is that we need to look at the energy and we need to look at the amount of stored uh, nutrition in the yolk. And so the bird species that's most likely precocial in this example would be species number two. Okay, and then the next question obviously will require that we explain that concept. And as I said, Precocial refers to the development of the young 
um, within an egg where they are born capable of being very independent. And so for that independence and for that development inside the egg, they need lots of yolk. And you can clearly see that the yolk has the highest percentage here, as well as the amount of energy available for that developing embryo to grow and become significantly developed so that soon after hatching, they can be independent. And it, that's essentially the rationale behind the reasoning for why I've picked bird species two as being the one that is precocial. Okay, the next question. Which one of the bird species, one, two, or three, will pr possibly produce offsprings requiring the highest degree of parental care? Now, guys, you know that parental care is a strategy that are adopted by, an, by individuals or parents that, that need to care for the young depending on the level of development, depending on the number of offspring. And we've often used graphs where we've indicated um, what we call the K strategy graph, survivorship curves, and the R strategy graphs. And so you know that mammals generally to show the K strategy, and that's a type 1 strategy where the individual grows and there are few offsprings produced but they have a great chance of surviving to reaching adulthood. On the other hand we have the R strategy and this would point to individuals or species where they produce large number of offsprings but there is an immediate decrease in the possibility of them surviving to become adults and we find that the few that do survive initially will gradually survive to become adults. And so we're comparing these two strategies in this question. So to respond to this, which of these will show the greatest amount of parental care? We would need to look at the stages of development internally and the amount of energy available. And of these, we would see that there's significantly less yolk. There is obviously very little energy available. And hence, the possibility that these young would have developed soon after birth would require lots of energy and parental care. And so my answer would be species number one, and the rationale for that would be that there's very little yolk, it's also very little energy, so the development within the egg is significantly less, and lots of that development is only com completed after the baby or the young are hatched, and that would require extensive parental care, which, in which requires that the, that the mother, the parents bring in food they sit over the young, they, they keep them warm until those down feathers start developing. And gradually they grow uh, feathers and wings and their muscle grows because of the food that they eat. And that takes a good two to three weeks and requires a lot of nurturing and care from the parents. And so you find that these birds often produce fewer eggs because of the high degree of parental care. Okay, cool. So guys, we're gonna move on to the next section. And the next section is uh, we're going to study is the reproductive cycle of the female. And we're going to look at a few questions based on the changes, the hormonal changes during the menstrual cycle and try and understand what are the hormones that control and affect the female reproductive cycle. Okay, cool. So let's get straight into this. And so this question again shows you an elaborate spread of the different graphs that represent hormones produced over a 28-day cycle. So if we look at the 28-day cycle, we're seeing the average cycle of a, the reproductive cycle of a woman lasts for about 28 days. And we know that there are significantly uh, different uh, hormones responsible for the processes and changes that happen. So if you look at it, there's FSH, which we've looked at previously. There's estrogen. And there are two other hormones called hormone A, and hormone B, which are unknown, and obviously that's going to require that we able to identify these. And, and the easiest way to identify that is to look at the interrelated uh, relationship between these two. When we look at FSH, and we know that FSH is the hormone that is released right at the start of the cycle, FSH from the pituitary gland targets the ovaries, and that would increase the development of the primary follicle. And we see that there's a gradual increase in the level of FSH um, as we get from day one. So I'm going to undo that because this can get pretty um, uh, busy with time. Okay, so we go back to our pen, and so that's the level of FSH. And if we look at the level of FSH, we will see that it increases and then it kind of reaches a peak around day 12. And that is when 
the ovary, the, the ovary contains the, probably the largest follicle in there, in which we refer to as the graffin follicle. And that graffin follicle ruptures around day 12, in this case day 12, 13, to release an egg. And that process we refer to as ovulation. And ovulation is tied up with this hormone here, which seen, tends to peak around day 13. And that hormone that we're looking at is LH. And we know that LH is what stimulates ovulation. And it tends to peak just before the time of ovulation. So if you look at ovulation, in this case, occurring on this day here, which is approximately around day 13, we can see that LH peaks just before ovulation, which would mean that this graphene follicle ruptures and releases the secondary oocyte. We also see the level of estrogen. In this case, I'm going to change my pen to a slightly different color. Okay, We see the level of estrogen, which is indicated by this dotted line or the dashed line. And that, li that hormone tends to increase as the follicle develops. And that's due to the follicle stimulating the ovary to release estrogen. And we see that those are the two hormones that initially are responsible during the initial 12 days. And then we see the next two hormones, which are LH, which we've identified, and hormone B, which tends to peak just after ovulation. And we know that this hormone is progesterone. And progesterone is what takes over the role of estrogen um, after day 14. And we'll look at the function of S progesterone. So that's kind of very quickly analyzing the graph. We now need to look at the questions uh, related to this. OK. So as I said, the first question was identify hormone A. And we've done that successfully in this. When we looked at hormone A, we identified that it tends to peak just before ovulation. And that's a, very, that's a cue that you must always look for. So which is a hormone that peaks, pe peaks just before ovulation? It would be LH. And its significance is linked to ovulation. OK? The next question is, on which day of the cycle did ovulation take place? Well, fortunately, I've noticed that in the graph, they have been kind in indicating to us the day of ovulation or the time when ovulation takes place. So all you need to do is, well, they've been kind enough to even extrapolate that down. And so you clearly see a line there, which actually you can use your ruler to draw down to the x-axis. And that's going to be the day here, which is between day 12 and day 13. Guys, it's important that you need to be cautious about assuming that ovulation always takes place on day 14, which is generally what we discuss in school. But if you look clearly at this graph, you can clearly see that ovulation was on day 13. So be guided by the peak in the LH level as an indicator of when ovulation takes place. And then you extrapolate that down onto the x-axis to determine specifically which day. OK, so guys, we've gone through the female reproductive cycle. There are a few more questions that I would have loved to do, but I know that you guys have had uh, an intensive session listening attentively. So Luni, I think our learners deserve a good break, and then we'll join you after that. All right. Thank you so much, Egan. Guys, we are going to take a quick break, so don't go anywhere. We'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. If you've just joined us, we are doing your final exam prep to help with the upcoming exams. Don't forget to take part in that assessment. Just download the To Enable app for free on your app store so that we can go through some of your answers later on in the show. If you're someone who's constantly running out of data, then this next competition is just for you. Wazo Matrix is bringing you the hashtag Wazo Winner competition, where two lucky matriculants stand a chance to win two gigs of data. All you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Hugan, and over to you. Thanks, Luni. So folks, we're back into the second segment of this session. We're going to continue with the female reproductive system, and we're going to look at a few more questions on this before we move on to the next question. So guys, as I mentioned, that this question was taken from a paper written in the Eastern Cape in 2020. Um, expose yourself to many different questions. The more you do that, different examining boards, the better it is for you. So when we look at this question, the question requires us to describe the effect of estrogen 
on the endometrium from the seventh to the thirteenth day of the cycle. So let's get to the graph. So I'll read the question again. We need to describe the effect of estrogen. That's the first part. On what? The endometrium. And when? From the 13th, from the 7th to the 13th day. So we're going to get back to the graph. And because we've got it on two different screens, I'm going to go back to there. So, so we've got to look at from day 7, which is here, all the way to day 13. And we've got to look at the effect of estrogen. So I've... I've kind of zoned in onto the specific parts of the question. So we, get, we need to look at estrogen on the effect of the endometrium between days 7 to day 13. Now, guys, the endometrium thickness hasn't been indicated here. If we go back to understanding what the function of estrogen is, we know that estrogen starts to prepare the lining of the endometrium in anticipation that fertilization may occur on day 14 or around ovulation. So the function of estrogen is to prepare the thickness of the lining of the endometrium so that it becomes more vascular. So in many graphs that you would have seen, they often compare a composite graph showing the relationship between the levels and the thickness of the endometrium. So essentially, you would have to say, if I were to graphically illustrate this here, and if that was a graph there, I would, let me, um, let me just redo that to the, get it a bit neater. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back to that. So if I was graphically illustrating the thickness of the endometrium, I would show that there was a thinning of it, and that would be menstruation. And then gradually, that starts to thicken up there. And you will see that it probably gets to its peak around day 13 or 14. And then it's maintained by what we know as progesterone, and then as progesterone levels decrease. So if you, if you were trying to explain the effect of the role of estrogen between that period, you would have to say, well, it starts to thicken the endometrial lining from day 7 onwards until it reaches probably day 14 or 13 in this case where it's highly vascular or thick, and that is in anticipation of probably an egg that is released being fertilized and implanted. Okay. So we move on to the next one. The drop in the level of which hormone, okay, so we've got to identify the hormone, causes menstruation. And I'll take it back to the graph because that often can help. And so guys, remember that menstruation takes place, if I were to illustrate that over this graph, it would take place from day one around to day six. And so if I were to graphically illustrate on this red line indicating the thickness of the endometrium, you would note that there is a significant decrease or, or drop in the thickness towards the end of the 28-day cycle. And that is linked to this hormone here, which is, yes, if you remember, it's progesterone. And if you think of the function of progesterone, progesterone functions in maintaining the thickness of the endometrium. So if we remove S progesterone or if we decrease its level, its core function in terms of maintaining the thickness of the endometrium will no longer take place, and that will cause the lining of the endometrium to shred away and to peel off the myometrium. And that's what initiates the start of menstruation. Okay. So guys, we're going to move to one more question, and then we'll change to a different topic. Explain why the secretion of FSH is inhibited by high levels of hormone B. Now, we've got to know why, and unpack the question. The secretion of FSH, that's the first part. Inhibited means to stop or to slow down. So to inhibit would be to stop the high levels of hormone B. So explain why FSH is stopped by high levels of hormone B. Now, we'll go back to the graph. Okay. So if we go back to the graph, we can see FSH here. Okay, that's that graph. Tends to decrease by high levels of hormone B. And guys, remember that after ovulation, we have the rupturing of the graphene follicle. And so that graphene follicle, which is stimulating the ovary to release um, estrogen, now degenerates. So we have the stimulus which is the graphene follicle now removed. And so we find that 
the level of progesterone has a negative feedback on the level of estrogen, causing it to decrease and maintaining the function of the endometrial lining by producing more um, progesterone. So you'll find that in this question, the rationale for that would be that the, high, the, the secretion of FSH is inhibited because we have the, the corpus luteum, which takes over the function of that. So we have that being the rupturing of the corpus, the, the graphene follicle, and then we have a follicle that now degenerates. And it is this rupturing of the graphene follicle that causes a decrease in the level of FSH, and we have the maintenance of the corpus luteum, which causes an increase in the progesterone levels, and that is what maintains the progesterone. So it's the corpus luteum that is important in releasing it, and it is the effect of ovulation which causes a decrease in the levels of FSH. So guys, we're going to move on to the next question, and that comes from a question that was taken from, again, the Eastern Cape September prelim exams. An experiment was conducted to determine the effect of hormone thyroxine on the body mass of Xenopus lavus frogs. So obviously, um, this experiment was looking at the effect of thyroxine on the development and the body mass of frog species Xenopus lavus. Okay? Let's read further into this experiment. The procedure was as follows. So we need to look at what, is, what they've done. 44 Xenopus lavus frogs tapoles, so the young of them, were captured and divided into two equal groups. So they've separated the 44 into two equal groups. So that means they worked with two groups having 22 tadpoles each. And let's see what they did next. The average initial body mass of each of the groups was calculated before the start of the experiment. So they calculated the average body mass of the two groups. 22 of the Xenopus lavus frog tadpoles were treated with a solution of thyroxine. So they've applied a bit of thyroxine for 21 days. So that was over a 21-day period. And the other group of 22 frogs of tadpoles were treated with a, solu so with a solution of 1% sodium hydroxide, or NaOH, for 21 days. So you've clearly applied thyroxine to one group and the other group a solution of sodium hydroxide. Okay? Let's read further into the experiment. The treatment was stopped after 21 days, and then the final average body mass of each group was calculated. So we've compared two groups, a group that had thyroxine and another group that had sodium hydroxide. Okay. So those results are then illustrated in the graph below. So we're seeing that the average initial and final body masses in grams for both the thyroxine-treated and sodium hydroxide-treated groups are indicated in the graph below. So here the key is very important for us to note. So we've got this group being the group that has been treated with sodium hydroxide or NaOH. And we also have the other group that was treated with thyroxine. So that group has been treated with thyroxine. Okay? And we see that this being the initial group, and this was the group after 21 days. So we're comparing the change in body mass on the y-axis. So the body mass has been indicated on the y-axis, and that's obviously measured in grams. And so if you look at this, you can see that the initial group and the final group tend to have shown significant changes in the body mass. If we compare the group that had thyroxine, we would see that you, there's a significant decrease in the body mass of the group that we treated with thyroxine. Now, in, in order for us to understand and interpret these results, we've got to go back to the function of thyroxine. Now, remember that thyroxine is released from the thyroid glands. And the function of thyroxine is, one, is to maintain, most importantly, your basal metabolic functioning. So in terms of the processes of digestion, it controls um, a nervous coordination, it regulates heart rate, it regulates many processes in the body. So if we remove thyroxine, or if we reduce the levels of thyroxine, it's essentially going to maintain, affect most of your metabolic processes. So in terms of the production of muscle, the process of gaining weight or losing weight will significantly be altered if we were to manipulate or change thyroxine levels. So we know that 
if we suffer from a condition called hypothyroidism, which is extremely low levels of thyroxin, our body mass might possibly increase. And that's because thyroxin maintains body metabolism. If we increase the levels of thyroxin to extremely high levels, higher than normal, you would see that that would have a negative effect. That would cause an increased rate of metabolism, which could cause a decrease in the a rapid decrease in the weight of an individual. Okay, so let's get straight into some of the questions based on this. So here, name the gland that secretes thyroxine. And as I mentioned, the gland that secretes thyroxine is the thyroid gland. So that's the thyroid gland that's situated right uh, below the larynx. And, and it's a gland that is important in producing uh, many hormones, of which thyroxine uh, is one of them. Okay. The second question, identify the independent variable in this experiment. And often, guys, we would get these questions where we have to interpret a graph and, and respond to questions based on the variables, the control, and all write a heading for the graph. And if we look at this, there's lots of information on this graph. So learners often are confused as to how to differentiate between the dependent and independent variable. And I often remind the learners to write down the capital letter I and the capital letter D. And so if you use that as an indication of where the independent variable would be, and that as an indication of the dependent variable, well, that would help you not to get confused. The next is for us to identify, in, in this case, the independent variable, which would be on the x-axis. And the independent variable here is time. And we're looking at the effect of the treatment of sodium hydroxide and thyroxine over a period of time. So it's not just time, but it's the effect of these two chemicals or substances on the individuals over a period of time. So we're expressing the effect of those as a factor of time. And the dependent variable, if we were asked, would be the average mass of the mice, or in this case, the, the frogs, over that period of time. Okay, which information displayed in the graph is used as a baseline data to make a conclusion at the end of the experiment? So, so basically, a baseline data would be what we call in science as a control group. And so here we've got two groups that were subjected to treatment. The one group was subjected to sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and the other group was subjected to the hormone, in this case, thyroxine. So guys, why would we have to do that? We would have to know what the difference is between a group that has got the variable that we're testing, in this case, thyroxine, and a group that does not have that variable, to see the comparative differences between the two. OK, so, so if we were to go back to the question, just very quickly, so we were to determine what the control was. And in this experiment, if you looked at the group, this would have been the control group because you had them subjected to sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and we compared that to a group that was being treated with thyroxine. So the control group or the baseline group is these individuals. And clearly from that, you can draw, you can draw a comparison to that difference over 21 days as saying, well, this is what would have happened under normal conditions. However, this is the difference when the independent variable, in this case thyroxine, is being applied to the, to the test group. So this would be our test group showing us the effect of not having thyroxine. And hence, that would be the comparison to the control groups, which are the grayed out areas on this graph, which is the group that is being treated with sodium hydroxide. And the last question before we get into a little break would be, explain why there is a drop in the final body mass of the thyroxine-treated tadpoles as compared to the sodium or NaOH-treated tadpoles. So guys, if we, do look at that, if we do look at that graph again, you can see that here you've got the average body mass being approximately, if I go to the scale, it's probably around 0 0.84 grams. And if you look at it after 21 days, it's about 0 0.6. So there's a significant decrease in the mass. of. And so let's try and understand why that has happened. Guys, as I mentioned, thyroxine maintains body function in terms of basal metabolic reactions. So if you remove 
thyroxin from your body, there's two things that's going to happen. You're going to essentially not allow the body to be able to process uh, metabolic reactions. And one significant reaction would be the ability for the body to produce muscle and to gain weight. So if you take away thyroxin, you have a high chance of not being able to produce the muscle and the meat that the body needs in terms of growth. And so guys, that ends the section on, on looking at those questions. I think you guys have done well. You've hanged, hung in well there. Hope you guys have answered those questions. And if you haven't, we're going to give you a chance to do that. But Looney, I think our learners have been very well tuned in. Give them a break. All right. Thank you, Eugen. Guys, let's take a quick break and we'll see you shortly after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are still doing your final exam prep to help you with the upcoming exams. So you can thank you so much. Take it away. So Matrix, it's interesting. I'm glad that you guys have responded to our questions that we've posted. Uh, I've seen your answers, and I think there's some interesting trends in your answers, and I can understand the confusion that you guys have picked up. So let's look at these questions. Let's try and analyze the responses that you've given, and let's try and understand why that confusion is has come up. And I think it's an important part of being able to prepare for this exam is to understand why you've got something wrong more than why you've got it right because it's sometimes easy to guess an answer. But if you get something wrong now and if you understand why you've got it wrong, it helps you to understand the process. So let's look at that first question that we posted. And the question read, during meiosis 2, so guys remember meiosis has got meiosis 1 and 2 which essentially refers to different phases of the division. The first option was A, the chromosomes arrange at the equator of the cell in homologous pairs. I'm going to read the answers out. B, the chromosome number is halved, so there's a reduction in the chromosome number. Or C, the chromosomes line up at the equator of the cells individually. Let's focus on the word individually. And D, the whole chromosome moves to the opposite poles of the cell. So there's some key words here, move, okay, which I often use as what we call recognition signals to help me remember what is it. Arrangement at the equator, so that should give you a, a key to a phase. Chromosome number is halved, that should help you to recognize a feature of that phase. So again, let's look at your responses. Okay, we'll go back to that. So if we look at, many of you have responded, and we can see that there's a significantly high percentage of you that have chosen the option of C, okay? And closely followed by that is option D. And so guys, if we look at this difference here between C and D, it tells me that there's a lot of confusion between these two. I haven't given you the answer yet, but I'm going to just, this tells me that there's confusion between the two. Clearly some of you that picked up the option A and B would probably realize that those are probably not the correct options. So we've got to try and understand why is there a confusion or these two options very similar. So if we go back to the question, the question reads, okay, during meiosis 2. Now during meiosis 2, there's a lot of things that happen, guys. And remember that meiosis 2 is the second phase of division where the chromosome numbers have already been halved and each of those cells undergo what we call prophase 2 where there's no crossing over, but the, the, the nuclear membrane disappears. The chromosomes now are in single chromosomes. The pairs have separated into the different cells. And then they kind of now start preparing for metaphase 2. And in metaphase 2, the chromosomes would have met now as single chromosomes along the equator, arranging themselves as single chromosomes along the equator. During anaphase 2, we know that the centromere splits the contractile filaments pull the chromatids apart. And we find that the chromatids are pulled to the opposite poles. So anaphase 2 is identified by the chromatids being pulled apart. And then obviously in telophase 2 we have now chromatids aligning themselves along the poles of the cell. So using that information, let's see. So for me, the, answer, the correct answer here is that we know that the chromosomes line up at the equator individually. And that's the correct answer. However, lots of you have given me the answer D. And let's try and understand why D could have been, um, uh, or was probably an answer that was close but not correct. 
whole chromosomes move to the opposite poles. And guys, if you look at whole chromosomes, and that only happens during, we know that during anaphase one, you find that an entire chromosome is pulled to the opposite poles. So that is in anaphase one. But the description here is relating to meiosis two. So in meiosis two, we know that the chromosomes align themselves along the equator. So if that's the equator, you have chromosomes aligning themselves along the equator, and then you find that the chromatids will be pulled apart. And unfortunately, D is not the correct answer. And those of you that selected C, well done to you. And those of you that have chosen D, go back and read the descriptions. Okay. So interesting that there is that confusion still, and that it boils down to how you interpret these statements and how you link them to your understanding of the section. There was another question that we had posted, and I'm going to read through the questions, the options, and then we'll look at your responses. When the level of blood glucose rises, the body immediately reacts to the lower level to the lower to lower the level, my apologies, by secreting A glycogen, B insulin, C glucagon, or D adrenaline. Now guys, this takes us to the endocrine system and looking at how the endocrine system establishes homeostasis. We know that after consuming a meal, your blood sugar levels increase, and that's because of the process of digestion. The carbohydrates are broken down, and the blood sugar levels increase. You know that the body is going to respond to that high or change in, the, in blood sugar levels by trying to bring the levels back to normal. And it does that by the pancreas releasing a hormone. And the hormone that it releases is insulin, exactly. And insulin will try now to allow the cells to absorb more of that glucose into their the cells so that that glucose can be used by the mitochondria or converted and stored as uh, glycogen, which is a stored carbohydrate that the body would then use when it's needed. So we know that after consuming a meal, that the insulin levels are going to increase. And that's essentially how many patients that or individuals that have diabetes would need to monitor their blood sugar levels. So soon after or before a meal, they would take the necessary insulin um, injections or tablets that they would need. So in order for that insulin to start having its function or doing its function in terms of bringing the blood sugar levels down after consuming a meal. So interestingly, let's look at the responses that you guys have sent in. So as anticipated, lots of you, I think it's close to around 38% of you that have selected the correct option. And this option was pointing to insulin being that hormone. And guys, the other hormone that plays an important role, if we go back to the question in terms of the regulation, is glucagon. And I'm hoping that, well, glucagon was C. And so again, you can see that there is some confusion here. About 22% of you guys, I think 24% selected glucagon. And guys, it's important at this point for you to understand the differences between the two. And glucagon plays an important role in bringing the blood sugar levels back to normal. So if you've been fasting, if you've been playing sport and you find that you now haven't had a meal, the body needs energy and it gets that from converting the stored glycogen. It brings that from the liver and, and it uses glucagon to convert that back into uh, glucose, which is then going to be absorbed into your muscle cells to provide you with energy. Okay, so we've got one more question before we get into... Uh, Kind of just an overall talk as to how you prepare for the final uh, day of your exam. So guys, the third question. The process by which ova are produced from the germinal epithelium of the ovaries is known as, options are A, gametogenesis, B, oogenesis, C, spermatogenesis, or D, ovulation. And guys, if we look at the concept of development of an egg inside the ovary, we know that this happens during what we call oogenesis. And oogenesis is a type of cell division or meiosis which takes place specifically in the ovaries that produces the ova or the egg cell. 
We also know that a similar process occurs in the testes, and that is called spermatogenesis, which is the division that results in the formation of sperm cell. Collectively, oogenesis and spermatogenesis are known as gametogenesis. So we've seen three options in this. We've seen the option of gametogenesis. We've seen the option of spermatogenesis. We've seen also an option of oogenesis, which specifically points to the development of egg. Okay, so let's look at your options that you've selected. The options that we've got, again, you can see that a large percentage of you, almost 32% of you, were spot on. And well done, guys, because by this time you should know the difference. However, I'm worried about this group that have chosen. I mean, there's about 28% of you that have chosen the option of, um, and this option was gametogenesis. And so, yes, you're correct that the development of the eggs does take place during gametogenesis, but specifically in the ovaries, if we were relating to this question, the concept of egg development in the ovaries occurs through a process called oogenesis. And oogenesis specifically points to the development of the egg. So guys, we, it was interesting to see your responses, and I can see that there's often a doubt in your responses because there's a slight gap between uh, the most correct answer and then a second answer which is often put in there to confuse learners and that's essentially what the examiner does he needs or he or she needs to test in terms of your ability to be able to understand the concept so there's not going to be a clear answer where you initially can select an answer the options are close read the question well try and analyze which is the most probable answer and choose that wisely and if you have to go back to the question read that question again so that you can have a thorough understanding of how to interpret those options. So, in terms of me wrapping up, so a few pieces of advice. The night before the exam, go to bed early, guys. It's important that your brain relaxes and processes that information. Read through the instructions on the day of the exam clearly. Often we tend to get straight into the question without having read the instructions specifically. Those instructions give you key tips to interpreting the question or writing down the answer. Look at the mark allocation. Manage your time. Remember that you need to be cautious about time. And I wish you all the best. You've worked well. You deserve to do the best you possibly can get. Okay, from my side, over to you, Looney. Thank you, Guys, we're wishing you everything of the best for the upcoming exams. Take these tips that we've given you and use them wisely. We do have study resources on all our platforms, so please check those out as well. Congratulations to all our winners who will be announced on our Facebook page after the show. Don't forget to check out the schedule on www.wasametrics.co.za. And if you missed any of the lessons, please do check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe and give them a big thumbs up. From me, Looney, Nicolene, and Yugen, thank you and goodbye. Walls of Metrics 2021 Catch Up is brought to you by the Department of Basic Education, NECT, ETDP CETA, SABC, Multi Choice, and DBE TV on OpenView Channel 122 in partnership with.